can uh, go on with the next speaker. Yes, thank you, Dr. Dupinda. We can. Uh, I shall call upon our next speaker, Dr. Ziv Lefer from United States of America. Yes, sir. You can uh, share your screen, and uh, our participants are waiting to hear from you. Let me get the share up. Yes, we can see your uh, presentation. Good. You can go ahead. First of all, let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to each of you, wherever you may be located. Secondly, thank you very much to the organizers of this excellent conference for the invitation and for programs that have been presented. The title of this talk is Lookalikes, Pathologist Challenge, Parasite or Tumor, Brief Literature Review and Discussion. See my background and current activities. The hero of the story or the villain is the Kinococcus. Hero in the sense that, first of all, as we will see, it's important. Uh, villain in two ways. First of all, as a source of pathology and a problem in its own right. And secondly, because of the confusion and the possibility of misdiagnosis as we shall develop. Conococcus is a worm. Spirulum platyhelminthes, which are the flatworms as opposed to the roundworms. And it's fairly short, a couple of millimeters, five or six millimeters generally. The big tapeworms that we're familiar with can be 20 or 30 feet in the gut. So it's a very different story. Uh, generally speaking, has this appearance. This is the part where the eggs are developed. This is the part of attachment. Uh, other pictures will show various labels for the different subsegments, but this is, as I say, the hero of the story. Organism, it's Kinococcus granulosus, there are other species. Definitive host is the dog, and it goes through a normal life cycle. Your feces are released and you have injection ingestion by an intermediate host, usually a sheep. And then awful material usually presented to the dog as food, whether by the farmer or naturally. And you have sort of cycling back and forth in this sense. Uh, looking at it from the organism point of view, We'll start here with the dog. You have the adult form in the small intestine. When it comes out in the feces, you have embryonated eggs. The eggs will develop into an oncosphere, which hatches. And it's this form which will penetrate the intestinal wall of the next animal host. And there in this organism, you will have what's called a hydated cyst. We're going to refer to this many times means essentially a cystic structure, fluid filled uh, larval forms within, usually in the liver and the lungs. And these are released when you go through developmental stages, gets into the original definitive host back to the dog. As we said, protoscolex developing from the cyst, attaches to the intestine, development into fully adult form, and the process goes round and round. Except that sometimes these embryonated eggs can be ingested by humans, either in contaminated food, contaminated water. Uh, and then you set up a similar process 
you have oncospheres released and hydrated cysts form in various organs, depending on where they end up. And pathology results, which is our, our primary concern, unless you happen to be a veterinarian, in which case you worry about the dogs. I also worry about the dogs in terms of spread, as we have discussed. In people, pathology is known as a kinococcosis. Shows up primarily in the liver and the lungs, but can also be found in a number of other organisms, kidneys, spleen, heart, bone, and others. As we mentioned, it forms these hydrated cysts. And pathology results when the cyst itself simply physically grows large enough to impinge on other organs and cause damage to other organs. And furthermore, sometimes the cysts rupture and you have a host reaction to the released cysts, which can show up as fever, eosinophilia. More seriously, you can have anaphylactic shock. And in a slightly different sense, rupturing of the cyst results in dissemination and it can start in one organ and end up in a different organism. And that itself obviously is a problem. This organism and its concomitant pathologies are found extensively in the Middle East, but not only found in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, South America, Central Asia, uh, relatively speaking, rarely in the United States, uh, rarely in, in, in Western Europe. So there's a geographical message in the story, which I'll come back to. In terms of diagnosing a case of hydrated cyst or iconococcal disease, at the physical level, you can detect a cyst-like mass, especially in a region where you might expect it, where it's endemic. There are imaging strategies you can have CAT scan, you can see it by MRI, you can detect it by ultrasonography. There are serological tests which can also show its presence. And ultimately there is histopathology, you take a sample, you make a biopsy, you look at it and you can find either eggs or parts of the, the organism and make a diagnosis on that basis. Having mentioned histopathology, let's pause on that for the moment. Um, classically, everybody knows we, we make a biopsy, prepare a slide, pass it over to the pathologist, he looks at it, and he will use what I'll call old skills to analyze a slide. You know the difference between normal and abnormal. You scan the whole slide to find it. You find the area of pathology and you make your diagnosis. I'm using the word graded. Graded means stage it. Graded means depending on the particular pathology, it's benign or malignant, somewhere in between. It's melanomas, you have clock levels, and you have it's prostate tumors, you have Gleason scale, and, and so on, each one in its own terms, but you make that diagnosis. Today we have digital pathology, which means the same biopsy, the same preparation of a glass slide, only now you have a step whereby you digitize the slide to convert it to a digital form. And you use it, you view it, you need a special viewer, computer, where the computer acts like a microscope and the computer will be able to zoom in. In other words, 
a JPEG, the closer you get in, the more you magnify it, it gets fuzzy. You compute. Here, you were able to zoom in from, from four to 100, let's say, and still have your clarity from whole tissue down to, to nuclear level, and all on the computer. But what is new about the use of the digital pathology methodology is that you can do all kinds of other things. You can annotate the slide, draw a circle around it, underline it, put in a label, put an arrow to the area of interest. You can save it, you can archive and retrieve instead of mountains and sometimes dare I say, tons of, of glass slides on, on trays in, in, in rooms. Now it's all on the computer and you can bring up the slide at will. It also has advantage in teleconferencing where you can now have a second opinion, a diagnosis. You're in Africa, you're in Asia, you want to get an opinion from the Mayo Clinic in the United States. In two seconds, it can two people can be hooked up to the same slide and look at it. So you don't have to wrap and pack a glass slide and send it across the country or across the world. And you can make your diagnosis. You can also have two people at the same time looking at the same slide. And one or the other has control of the pointer and the panning and zooming and work together on that basis. And then you have what I'll call newer skills. This includes computational pathology, where you can now make measurements. You can make the, measure the distance between two structures or two cells. You can determine the perimeter. You can determine the volume and so on, howsoever that is relevant to your diagnosis. Multiplexing refers to use of antibodies hooked together with various dyes and stains that are either chemically detected or detected by fluorescence. And now you can have 40 or so different proteins in the same slide identified and characterized depending on the pathology, depending on your need, will identify tumor versus stroma versus immune cells and so on. And now you have artificial intelligence whereby you are training the computer to recognize normal versus abnormal, training the computer to make the identification. Uh, not quite ready, not this year, maybe next year, which is to say it's, it's a cutting edge in a field that's very much in process. But an important observation in this regard is that if you have 10 pathologists, one slide, 10 pathologists trained and experienced. The observation is you don't get the same diagnosis. Very rare that 10 out of 10 will not only stage it differently, but even plus minus normal or abnormal, which of course means how are you going to train the machine if the people don't agree. Having said all of this, and we have all these, and this is background information, we come back to old skills. And old skills means the trained scientist looking in the microscope or even looking on the computer and looking at the tissue and making his diagnosis and determining what he sees with the sum total of all his years of experience and his, all his other knowledge of the rest of the case and putting together all that information to interpret disease. Having said that, we come to the problem of lookalikes. It's always a problem. 
whatever the pathology, you will have other conditions that, that may mimic it, and it's sort of built into the question of diagnostic pathology. But in my case, you want to look at case of a dated cyst versus tumor. What's going to follow is a brief sampling of the literature. The general theme is what we thought it was and what it turned out to be. All of which is to make the general point that in many cases, what was thought to be a cyst turned out to be a tumor. What was thought to be a tumor turned out to be a cyst and all of concomitant problems. Example number one, here is a case in the kidney. We thought it was a tumor, turned out to be a cyst. Authors are from Korea. Here is the paper, Korean Journal of Parasitology, primary renal hydated cyst, misinterpretation as a renal malignancy, Choi et al. And I'm going to show you the abstract. I don't intend for everybody to be able to read this, or to, but I've, the bolding is mine, just to make certain points. Uh, the paper I said is from Korea, but the patient was from Uzbekistan in terms of where this pathology may have originated. You have a CAT scan, check the mass, Original diagnosis was that this was a renal malignancy. All right, mass was removed. Histopathology was carried out and the final di diagnosis was cyst. All right? However you want to call it, mistaken diagnosis or expanded diagnosis or rule in and rule out, but it looked like one and turned out to be the other. All right, in the microscope here is some of the cystic material that was detected that confirmed the diagnosis and different from what they got from the CAT scan and from palpation of a mass and so on. Case number two, again kidney, again thought it was a tumor, turned out to be a cyst was in India. This is Kadri et al. Isolated cystic echinococcosis of the kidney burlesquing as a renal cell carcinoma, a diagnostic pitfall. So pitfall tells you to be careful. Burlesquing means this look-alike issue. Annals of parasitology. And again, you had a cystic structure. You had some clinical pictures, pain, fever, hematuria. You had a CAT scan. Diagnosis was renal cell carcinoma. And by the end of the trail, you came to histopathological examination that you found hydrated cysts. And the diagnosis was changed to a kind of cocosis. Again, the message, beware and be prepared. Case number three, here is tumor in the pancreas, thought to be a tumor, turned out to be a cyst. Case was found in Iran. A dated cyst to pancreas mimicking, again, that keyword, neoplasm. Kashmorabat et al. All right, you go through the whole history. Um, point that they want to make is that hydrated cyst of the pancreas is rare. So that's, you know, it wasn't on the original list that I gave of where it's usually found and even sometimes found. Here is something which is rare. You wouldn't expect to find it. So it emphasizes the observation in this paper that even though it's rare, sometimes it is found and again, 
you can't just and prepare for it. Another case of pancreas, originally thought to be a tumor, turned out to be a cyst. You ran a primary hydrated cyst of pancreas, again, mimicking, again, neoplasm, Sam Ibis et al., Southern Medical Journal. And here, too, follow a trail beginning to get familiar with this. The physical level, you have a mass, you do the routine things you might expect, ultrasound, CAT scan. It's the primary assumption that it's a tumor. Take it out, do the histology on it, histopathologic evaluation, show that in fact it ended up to be a cyst. And again, rare in the pancreas, so don't overlook it. Next, we have pathology in the lung. Note that now it goes the other way around. It was originally thought to be a cyst, ended up to be a tumor. Seeing that our lung carcinoma mimicking hydrated cyst, medical oncology. By CAT scan, you've got something to worry about. Serology was positive for kinococcus granulosis. Take note. And finally, at the end of the trail, histopathological evaluation of the excised specimen showed large cell carcinoma. All right, bolding again in the red is mine, but what they say is, the case highlights the fact that a lung carcinoma may rarely have clinical radi rarely means not too often, but it does happen. I mean, sometimes have clinical radiological and serological features similar to those of pulmonary hydrated cyst. All right, so at the clinical level, it looked like a cyst. At the radiological level, it looked like a cyst. Even serologically, they had indications that it was a cyst. In the end, it and turned out to be carcinoma in the lung. Last case shows pathology in the liver. Again, thought it was a cyst, turned out to be a tumor. The case was in Turkey. Oral et al. case of undifferentiated embryonic liver sarcoma mimicking cystid hydatic disease in an endemic region of the world. This is largely a review of various possibilities in the diagnosis. What is right, the possibilities are undifferentiated embryonic liver sarcoma versus cystic hydatic disease. You read the paper and you go through all the details, but their bottom line message is surgeons who operate in endemic regions must be aware that not all hepatic cystic masses are necessarily hydatic disease. And maybe other more rare malignant malignant diseases such as liver carcinoma. So why is this all important? So we'll break it down as follows. First of all, for doctors in endemic areas, all those geographical regions that I mentioned earlier, you have to be aware of everything we just said possibility of mistaking one for the other. Seriously, legitimately, basis of evidence that confuses things. Obviously, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in terms of treatment. If it's a tumor, then, then a certain kind of surgery is done. Radiation is, is done. Radiation has a problem of damaging peripheral tissue, normal tissue, unless you're extremely focused and so on. Chemotherapy has, has toxic side effects. That is the bane of all patients taking chemo. On the other hand, if it's a cyst, again, well, many of these cysts are dealt with by surgery, but it's a different kind of surgery and perhaps less of a concern about 
you know, getting it all out in every last cell. Uh, chemical treatment, prosequintel, is, is very often the drug of choice. You wouldn't use that if it was a tumor. So you have to know the diagnosis in order to know how, how to treat. And one might argue that the prognosis is, is certainly different. You have a you know, diagnosis of carcinoma. You start to make out your will and, and so on. And uh, if it's a cyst, you worry about it less. So that's the concern. This is the same. Starting here, doctors, now this is doctors in endemic areas. Now we're shifting to doctors in non-endemic areas. Like I mentioned, United States, other areas where you don't see a kind of cocosis all that often. The problem is that it's not expected, right? So, so if, you, if you're in, in Asia, Africa, Middle East, you, you come across these cases, you expect it, you look for it. Where you never have it, you don't expect it, but it could happen. And you have to recognize it, you have to differentiate it from other pathologies. The problem is more complicated because I'm calling it today in our, our generation, as it were, compared to previous ages, decades. Travel is much more extensive, whether for tourism, whether people relocate and so on. And you may bring back conditions or people coming in may bring conditions, they bring their pets and the pets may have these infectious diseases and you have the patient themselves who's coming in from some of these other geographical regions to the United States, you have to know how to treat or to Western Europe and, and so on, places where it's not usually found. From a little different perspective, and from my own frame of reference, particularly critical, medical education, particularly in non-endemic areas, and here I'm getting on my soapbox, to make the point that is, is properly trained doctors. You can't just know what you're likely to see in your local area, right? You may never see a case of a kind of cocosis routinely in, in Brooklyn or New York or the United States and so on. But you might. And the message that I want to give over is to teach, at least at the postgraduate level, residency and beyond, the pathologies of other countries. We tend to be sort of generally isolated and there's obviously a logic to it. You teach what the students are, are likely to see as doctors. But I'm looking to expand that consciousness to suggest that you should know what pathologies are found, especially if you know that your patient is from the Middle East or from Asia or from Africa and so on. What kind of things might they carry that you don't know from your experience locally? I'm going to make this a side comment. Uh, teach microbiology amongst other things like pathology and I give a lecture on bioterrorism. And we talk about the pathogenic organisms, and obviously that's a major concern. Pathogenicity, mechanisms of disease causation, lethality, spread, and so on. But I also make the comment to my students that NIH list, CDC list, those organisms that are sort of selected as bioterrorism weapons, one of the reasons is because they're pretty much what I'll call oddball organisms, which means you only find them in animals, you only find them in, in uh, certain limited regions, which is to say things that doctors would not be 
expected, but my point is you need to recognize them. In other words, most doctors never saw or never will see a case in their practice in 50 years. I'm never going to see anthrax or smallpox, fullerenia or plague. But then we hope it never happened, but in preparation of the possibility that it might, you need to recognize it when they come across it. And my point here is to carry over this concept to the cyst tumor story we have been discussing. You may not see it where you are currently practicing, but your patient may have it and it's your job to recognize it. Bottom line is know your field well enough so you won't be fooled by lookalikes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zev Liefer, for such a wonderful portfolio of cases that we have had so far. Uh, and a nice compilation of all the cases put together uh, where um, cystic uh, lesions were thought to be as tumor and tumor lesions were thought to be cystic. It was wonderful. And uh, it kind of creates that sense of awareness for the endemic as well as the non-endemic country participants uh, who are present today to even look at it in this way. Thank you so much, Dr. Zeev Liefer, once again, uh, for the speech and for the insightful talk on it. And I would like to call upon the next speaker. But before that, if anyone has any questions for Dr. Zeev Liefer, you can ask. The platform is open for questions. If anyone would like to ask,